Hi, I'm Tom Long. You know, there's some stories in the Bible that just kind of hit me as being a little strange or, or offbeat, you know? And, and one of those stories is a story about near the end of Israel's journey across the wilderness. They've been rescued out of Egypt and they're almost to the promised land in the plains of Moab. And uh, they start complaining. And they complain that uh, there's not enough water, that the food is uh, terrible, and um, they don't like their living conditions. I can relate to that. These people had been journeying for nearly 40 years. Even as a young man, a week of backpacking and living in a tent was enough for me. I remember how after one such adventure, as my friends and I piled into the station wagon at the trailhead, we decidedly discussed the prospect of stopping at the nearest McDonald's. But they took their complaints to the point of speaking against God and Moses. And here's where the story gets almost inexplicably weird. God sent venomous snakes among them, and these snakes were so poisonous that many people died. Loosely translating Numbers 21.7, the people said, uh-oh, we screwed up, sorry. Moses, get God to help us. And now the story really leans into its own weirdness. God tells Moses to make a snake and stick it on a pole and raise it up in the midst of the people. Whenever people looked at the snake, they were cured from the snake's venom. This whole situation is about as confusing to me as Jesus' teaching was to Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, as Jesus tells Nicodemus about being born again, he's like, um, exactly how's that going to happen? An adult can't go back into their mother's womb. Jesus tells him that he is talking about being born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, although a learned man, asks, how can this be? In our Gospel reading for this week, Jesus tries to make his meaning plain. And he does this by referring back to the story of the bronze snake on a pole and says that he must be lifted up like that so that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Now, Jesus was lifted up in at least three ways. He was raised up on a cross. He was raised up from the tomb at his resurrection. He ascended into heaven. Jesus bore the judgment of our sins on a gory Roman cross. Believing Israelites looked to the bronze snake, which represented the judgment of their sins, a bronze snake representing the poison snakes on the plains of Moab. Jesus says, just as they look to that bronze snake, trusting in God's word, so anyone and everyone who looks to Jesus, lifted up on that cross, and trusts, will have eternal life. As we prepare to dive into the final paragraph of our reading, I want to ask you a question. Did you know that in general, Jesus viewed the world as hating him? He found the world to have the same attitude toward him as the Israelites had against God and Moses. Just something to keep in mind as we delve into this next paragraph. Jesus now begins to explain why the Son of Man must be lifted up, and the explanation begins with, the po with possibly the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3.16, which I'll read together with verse 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So even though he knew that the world hated him because he confronted evil, God's love for the world compelled him to send his Son to be lifted up for us. Now. Israel had grumbled against God and brought judgment on themselves. Our passage says that we are all, quote, quote, condemned already, because like them, we have all sinned against God. I just want to make it clear that just as the Old Testament doesn't sugarcoat human nature, <laughs> neither does Jesus. But even so, God's love persisted. 
Forty times in the Old Testament, God's love is described as unfailing love. God loves us, and there's nothing we can do to change that. He loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to offer those of us who were condemned already and therefore perishing, to offer us the option of obtaining eternal life. The word translated perish here comes from a compound word meaning to cut off or separate away from something. When we choose to do evil and to hide in the darkness of evil, we break our connection with God. And just as a limb that is separated from the tree dies, we also perish spiritually. The phrase eternal life is a bit trickier. Some take it to mean living eternally in heaven. But Jesus actually defines eternal life as he is praying to the Father in John chapter 17, verse 3. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The root of the word translated peace in the New Testament means to join. When we are joined back with God, make our peace with God, when we know God by placing our trust in God and the Son of God who is lifted up for us, when we believe, we receive this eternal life. A life that will sustain for as long as the eternal Creator exists, which is to say forever. But that life can begin now, the instant we enter into relationship with God. Our salvation isn't just going forward to receive Christ at a, at a church service, although it can start there. It's living a life in fellowship with God through Christ. That's what God wants for us. He wanted it so much that he was willing to die for us. So who is invited? For God so loved the world that whoever believes so we're talking about the whole world. Whoever believes. Some want to limit that offer to their own identity groups. But King Jesus says that this offer is to whoever will believe. That includes people I wouldn't choose to be around. That includes people who hate me. That even includes me. Jesus goes on to say some will choose evil and darkness because that's what they love. Like someone who ignores their symptoms and refuses to see a doctor because they don't want to face the reality they might be ill and that healing is going to require them to change, others will receive the gift of being connected with God and the life that comes with that choice. I choose to be a part of the family of God, joining with God in God's unfailing love for the whole world, even the parts of the world that hate God and God's people. Why? Because God loves us all, every one of us. And if we're with God, we should love them too.